Skoda Crick 2017 review. The Yeti has morphed into the Crick for its second generation, and this early drive reveals a solid, practical small SUV that could challenge the class best. What is it? The new Skoda Yeti isn't actually a Skoda Yeti anymore. That's right, one of the last beacons of creativity in the naming of cars has gone out, replaced by a rough translation of Car Arrow in the language of a tribe in Alaska, to give us the Skoda Crick. Skoda had a hit on its hands with the Yeti. It was an early arrival in the small SUV world, with enough quirkiness to mask its obvious compromises and shortcomings. It was likable a bit different, and sold well right to the end of its life. Its replacement, the Crick, is something altogether more conventional, not just because of its name. It's effectively Skoda's version of the Sitka and upcoming Volkswagen T-Rock. It's grown slightly in size over the Yeti in all departments, chiefly for the benefit of interior passengers, and in true Skoda style ends up with a boot much bigger than that of its chief rival, the Nissan Qashqai. You can play a game of Volkswagen Group MQB platform bingo with a lot of the Crick's spec. There are five engines in the range, all direct injection turbocharged units with EU6 emissions compliance, ranging from a three-cylinder 1.0-liter TSI unit with 113 bhp to a range-topping 2.0-liter TDI with 187 bhp. Four of the five engines offered on the Crick were not offered on the Yeti. Front-wheel drive and a six-speed manual gearbox are standard, with four-wheel drive and a seven-speed dual-clutch automatic gearbox offered with certain engines. Hidden under the camouflage of the development car we've been granted an early drive-in is a look inspired by the larger seven-seat Kodiak in Skoda's growing range of SUVs. We'll get to see the finished package on 18th of May. What's it like? It should be of no surprise that the Crick provides a driving experience familiar from that of other MQB-based SUVs, albeit tuned to a more Skoda-friendly flavor. That means the suspension has a softer setup than the Tka, which manifests itself in offering a better ride than its firmer Spanish sibling at higher speeds. It handles large compressions and long wave undulations well, but soft does not always mean comfortable. The low-speed ride is inconsistent, with the car fidgeting on all but the smoothest of surfaces. Our test car was fitted with the standard passive dampers, which do a poor job of isolating occupants from scarred road surfaces. The fact that Skoda has sped up development of its optional dynamic chassis control adaptive dampers to fix this issue is telling, and they should be available at the launch of UK cars, if not soon after. The Crick's softer setup also means more body roll through corners. As for the steering, it's very light when left in the normal driving mode. Switching over to the sport mode adds more resistance but it still feels over-assisted and remote. There is also noticeable suspension noise, which fast seems to be becoming a Skoda trait. Our test car was equipped with the lower-powered 148bhp version of the familiar 2.0 TDI engine. It's wanting for little to suggest you'll need to trade up to the 187 bhp range stopper. It's brisk in a straight line once you're over the initial hesitation of the optional DSG gearbox before it shuffles nicely through the gears. It's a very tractable engine, and impressively refined. Some four-wheel drive versions of the Yeti can also claim a mite of off-road ability. Selecting the off-road mode in the Crick activates hill descent control and keeps the car in a low gear. It feels more capable off-road than the Peugeot 3008 with a similar setup, but it would be wrong to call the Crick an off-roader with its limited ground clearance and wheel articulation. Conquering a muddy field it can do, though, and that'll be fine with its owners. They'll also be very pleased with the Crick's interior, which is one of its real highlights. The design has greater differentiation to those of its MQB siblings. The star is the addition of the digital instrument display known elsewhere as the Volkswagen Active Info Display and Audi Virtual Cockpit. It has made it into the Crick as the imaginatively named digital instrument panel, and shows key driving, sat-nav and infotainment information in the instrument binnacle. Elsewhere inside, the build quality is impressive 
and the overall design and layout is inspired by the Kodiak. This is a good thing. Being a Skoda, rear space and boot space have been made a priority, the Crick has a lashings of both, with the storage space under the front seats a particularly nice touch. The removable Variaflex rear seats of the Yeti are carried over to the Crick, and boot space is class leading, at 488 liters or a maximum of 1810 liters in full van mode. Should I buy one? The Kirk is likely to prove a winner off the back of the fact it does the things that all other Skodas do well to make them a success, by being better value than its rivals and offering more space. The Kirk already ticks the spaciousness box, and the indications are from insiders that the Kirk will actually undercut the Yeti, coming in at a very competitive 17,770 pounds. It's a shame some of the Yeti's originality has been lost, and not just in the name. But, firm ride aside, buyers are unlikely to find anything to be put off by. The MQB train rolls on. Honda FCV Clarity Review This is the new Honda FCV Clarity, the latest attempt by the Japanese manufacturer to gain the high ground on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, and one that's under more pressure than ever before, thanks to the recent arrival of the Toyota Mirai. Indeed, whereas Honda's previous fuel cell vehicles have been praised for their technical innovation, they've also been available to only a select few. The firm made just 72 examples of the last effort, the FCX Clarity, but it has much higher hopes for the FCV Clarity, which will be made in much greater numbers and is seen as a stepping stone to Honda's first mass-produced fuel cell vehicle, currently in development, some of it shared with General Motors and due in 2020. As with the Clarity, the FCV Clarity sits on a bespoke platform, but it gets two hydrogen tanks instead of one, with both storing the fuel at a higher pressure, 700 bar instead of 350. This is designed, Honda engineers say, to answer the single biggest concern that's come across in feedback from Clarity owners, range. That car managed 240 miles in the U.S. test cycle, Honda says the FCV Clarity can crack 300 on the same standard, and it should be north of 400 in many real-world situations. At the heart of it all is a new fuel cell stack, a third smaller than before and, astonishingly, 90% cheaper to produce. The more compact package has allowed Honda to move it away from the transmission tunnel area to under the bonnet. That frees up cabin space, allowing the FCV Clarity to be a five-seater. Honda hasn't announced a European on-sale date, let alone a price, but around 200 examples will be leased in Japan next year. The nominal figure for the car is 7.66 million yen, or around 42,000 pounds, but that will simply be divided by the length of the lease. A 48-month deal as was common with the few FCX Clarity cars that were leased, should cost around £875 per month in Japan. As with most fuel cell vehicles, the FCV Clarity is remarkably straightforward to use. You select drive, then ease away in near silence. The only noise you're likely to hear, should you not be doing a sufficient rate of knots to create tire roar, is what sounds like a faint gurgling from under the bonnet. But in the most part, there's no real mechanical noise to speak of, think of it as an EV that doesn't need plugging in, or a Toyota Prius-like hybrid where the combustion engine simply never fires up. Our test route was a short loop at Honda's Tochigi Research and Development Center, and Honda has yet to issue any official performance figures anyway, but it's already clear that the FCV is set up for cruising comfort instead of out-and-out -out performance or agility. The cell has a nominal output of 134 bhp, which is enough for brisk acceleration, even up to a motorway cruising speed. Once you're there, you'll just hear some wind noise from around the door mirrors, and the aforementioned rumble from the road below. It's just like a reasonably refined executive saloon, basically, although again, we had no opportunity to throw it at anything approaching a sharp corner. Honda is planning a series of accessories for the car, 
including a small hydrogen production station designed for use by a few vehicles and a neat inverter that can take electricity produced by the fuel cell and power a range of domestic devices. Honda suggests it could have uses in emergency medical situations, for example. Honda has had to strike a balance between giving the FCV Clarity's cabin a high-tech look and making it something that could be used every day, and the result looks a fair compromise. There's a central infotainment screen in the center of a neat dashboard, and the center console extends out towards the area between the front seats, with gear selector buttons above and a storage area below. The rear cabin still isn't the most spacious for a car of this size, but three adults could just about squeeze in together for a reasonable journey. Honda hasn't issued any specs on boot capacity, but there's no denying that some space is taken up by the main aluminium and carbon fiber wrapped hydrogen tank. Engineers say you can fit three sets of golf clubs in there, and that's probably true. But sliding a wider, flatter suitcase over the top of the step in the boot floor could prove more of a challenge. For just a moment, let's merely celebrate the fact that you can. Honda is not going to hide the FCV Clarity behind the same veil of rarity that obscured the FCX Clarity for much of its life, this really is a step towards the mass production of fuel cell cars. Pricing could be another matter, of course, even the huge saving on the cost of the fuel cell stack over the old Clarities is nowhere near enough, according to a senior engineer and that's before you get to deciding whether the fledgling infrastructure is enough to support any journey you may want to tackle. These remain early days for fuel cell vehicles, but with the Ryan now the FCV Clarity, it really does seem like a generational leap is being made. Made.